Hey everyone, welcome to the Frontiers Cafe, CFET's new podcast. My name is Milan Zivkovic, and I'm a grad student in LA and a volunteer for the festival. I'll be your host, and each week I'll interview a special guest from our CFEST community, including but not limited to directors, writers, playwrights, producers, and volunteers. On today's episode, I had the pleasure to chat with Dr. Farid Ben Youssef, an assistant professor of film and media at Texas Tech University. During our chat, we mostly talked about the 2017 Hungarian film Jupiter's Moon, about a Syrian refugee who has superpowers in modern day Hungary. I hope you enjoy our chat. I'm Milan, your host, as always, and we are having a lovely chat via Zoom. As you can tell, uh, today's theme is superheroes and ethnic identities, I would say, or just identities itself and how this mm -hmm. interplays, especially as we're entering the, well, while settling into the 21st century and these questions of nationality and what that does in determining one's role in society are much more, I want to say, aware of the nuances and the complexities are going on. We're, we're kind of this drifting away from the nation state and kind of embracing more of a communal aspect of identities. And we, the films in question have been Jupiter's Moon, a 2017, I believe, Hungar yes, 2017 Hungarian science fiction film about essentially it's what if a Syrian refugee was Superman. Um, the quick Wikipedia summary. And we're comparing it with Invincible. I believe that came out two years ago on Amazon mm -hmm. Studios. The hypergraphic, but also hyper-satirical animated superhero series. And so, Fareed, well, where should we start? We were riffing on the idea of, of otherness and that role defining the superhero, which is of also a big part of my thesis, but we can go from any Ooh. direction. You know? uh, I, well, I guess I'll ask, uh, thank you so much for that introduction. And I should say for your listeners that uh, I come to the superhero, uh, you'll sort of see this is, is, is quite marked by a specific reading of superhero and these types of genre forms, Milan, uh, like film noir, Western, these set sort of archetypical forms, I see in them the possibility not for pure escapism, but rather as a space in which we can reckon with state violence and our mm -hmm. own complicity within that violence. I find genre movies are so exciting because they ask us to enjoy violence, you know, and, and, they, and, I, and I always think that that's very like, you know, as someone who's a big fan of superheroes, but as a, a French Tunisian, French Arab, uh, disabled person, uh, I could imagine that Bruce Wayne would not be my friend. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, Tony Stark uh, would not be my friend. You know, uh, both uh, specifically in their modern cinematic variants, these very wealthy white men, these white superheroes are very tied into the military industrial complex. Uh, you know, they're both, um, and this is in the Nolan universe in particular, the Christopher Nolan Dark Knight series stemming from Batman Begins in 2005 to The Dark Knight Rises in 2012, and the Iron Man series that started in 2008 with, with Iron Man. Uh, both mm -hmm. of these heroes are tied in intimately with the military industrial complex. And that's something that you see throughout um, Hollywood's versions of the post 9 11 superhero. Is that like, think of the shield, uh, you know, the kind, and the mm -hmm. Avengers as being kind of uh, closely tied to the, to the state. Um, and so for me, I'm really intrigued by these forms. And indeed, I'm uh, just going to uh, publish a book and, you know, I'll, I'll send you the link to the, the synopsis after our conversation. So you can put it on any website or whatever. Oh, great, you want. great. Uh, but I'm, I'm just now uh, finishing a book on post 9-11 genre cinema. Those are the storytelling types, like the superhero, the Western and noir. It's from SUNY Press. It's called No Jurisdiction, Legal, Political and Aesthetic Disorder. 9-11 genre cinema and it grapples it sort of mixes analysis and autobiography to kind of grapple with my own love for superheroes <laughs> who destroy brown people like themselves on screen and that's i think that the superhero has the possibility to really face different fissures of identity we were just talking moments ago about how this the superhero starting with superman is in some ways it's, it's a fig it's a archetype about power, but mm -hmm. at the same time, given it's, it's uh, or his connection, Superman's connection with the immigrant experience, specifically the Jewish um, immigrant experience, uh, 
within uh, a, a pre-World War II setting, right, as World War II was happening and, and corresponding with the, uh, the rise of the Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, there's also, I think, an interesting seed of disempowerment within the icon. And that's why I think the superhero is so exciting, because it allows us to experience great power, but I think in many ways it allows us to negotiate questions of powerlessness. It becomes our way in to these social and political realities that we would not like to face. And that's why going to Jupiter's moon, this Hungarian film that you mentioned by uh, Cornel Mundrusko, um, what I think is so exciting about this movie is by sort of saying, what if Superman was a Syrian refugee? It's, uh, a, as a kind of pitch for the film, it's reminding us of the way in which the icon of power that is the superhero is in many ways a vehicle, it can be a vehicle to confront powerlessness and for the powerless or the other in society, uh, wherever that society is, in this case, <laughs> Hungary, that they can find potential transcendence and resistance in the superhero. And I, I don't know if you agree with that, um, that reading of the film, but for me, that's in part why it's so exciting. And so I guess, you know, now that I've done a brief pitch with kind of how I approach these kind of violent forms as not only escapism, but also ways in which we can see state violence, we can be critical of it, and then we can sort of, see, we can at least hint at, in this case, I think really embody with Jupiter's moon, uh, the object of state violence. In this case, the Syrian refugee. I want to highlight that historically within Hollywood, post 9-11 Hollywood superhero films, even I think extending all the way back to the 70s Superman, there's always a sort of feeling that, um, that the superhero is a secular faith, you know, is essentially our gods in the secular cosmopolitan moment the, the some of the most striking versions of that is at the end of the film logan uh where you have the superhero logan die um spoiler i'm sorry it's been a while since that movie was out people should have seen it i said but you yeah. have that you have like that that uh the cross and his clone um, uh, a, a small girl takes the cross, and I find this to be such a wonderfully blasphemous moment, but also a reminder that these are, uh, James Mangold, the director, is reminding us that the superhero is fundamentally a religious icon, because remember, she takes the cross and she turns it on the, its side to make an oh, X. Yeah. And, you know, like there is this sense like the, the X of X-Men is essentially the cross for kind of classic Christianity, and Cornell is the director of Jupiter's Moon is really great at kind of highlighting that. And the last moment I would sort of say to highlight that scene you're talking about uh, at the beginning, somewhere in the Near East, I think in Afghanistan, you have Tony Stark presenting his wares to um, uh, to a bunch of potential buyers in the Department of Defense and in the military. And he's in a suit, he looks great. And he describes this as the Jericho missile which mm -hmm. reminds us about the walls of Jericho. And he, when, he shoots the, when he shoots the missiles, do you remember Milan? Like his body language, he actually forms a cross. Yep. Uh, you know, it's that like arms extended and out. The wind flows, but he doesn't get knocked over. It's so biblical, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is, I think you just want to say that that's a great sort of line in Milan to think about the superhero generally. It's so biblical, it's ridiculous. And like, I think, you know, when you go then to this hour in 1550 uh, se sequence where we have Aryan rising up, people running, terrified, et cetera, um, you know, this kind of these refugees and this encampment being disrupted, I believe. And as he rises, uh, you have this moment where uh, we have a, a citizen, a bystander. She's not linked to the, the kind of the crowds that, that Arian is a part of. She's in fact standing above the kind of the subterranean level that he's floating up towards. She's on the street, she's on the main street, she's visible, presumably a Hungarian citizen. Uh, and as, as she rises, there's a point of view shot, we think, a point of view shot from Arian's perspective, which means his eyes, right? Uh, and which are also our eyes in this moment. Right. And she sees him rise up and then she falls to her knees. 
Uh, and it's just this little moment where all of a sudden you have this kind of religious supplication going on. And if we take seriously that she is a kind of the center Hungarian citizen, and we'd have to kind of work through the scene together to make, to sort of make sure that's 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 held. But that kind of falling to your knees or calls kind of Christian ritual. And I think, again, we need to deal with the fact that the film invites us to inhabit the eyes of, in this moment, the eyes of, of, of a Muslim individual, or presumed Muslim individual, Syrian individual, uh, for sure, uh, darker, darker skinned. And that he, yet he becomes part of kind of Christian fervency, religious fervency, religious passion. And I'm, and I, for me, when I was watching that moment, I found myself, you know, really, I think, compelled because we have a sense that Hungary's resurrection is, in some ways, a contested site. We know it's a contested site where we have different power actors that promise a resurrected Hungary. Right. Uh, and here we have this possibility of like, I almost wondered if in this moment when she falls to her knees, and again, there is a real sense of, of gentle, I think an ex exquisite sense of gentle horror in the film because it's terrified. It's terrified by the mass death of, of associated with refugees and immigration. I think sure. there's also a terror towards the, 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 the immigrants. Even as the film, I think, is reminding us that the immigrant has power and needs to be sympathized with, the film will spend time with white Hungarians being terrified of, of Aryan, of what they see specifically in that one scene in the apartment where the, you know, the whole apartment begins to shift. Oh, um, and like, but so I'm, I, I want to just highlight that moment where uh, very early on, I think Laszlo says, I think this, my notes are rough here, but he says to our friend Ari, and he goes, you are no one, you are really troubled. And I remember that sense of like, no one being troubled, like to the, the, true, the true challenge to the state is someone who uh, is, is pure other. And I, the, in terms of the sound design, we need to talk about that in the scene as well, because as he rises, we see someone falls to her knees. I'll do the reading and then I'll throw it to you to see if you have any response yeah, with, sure, some, with sure. some of these. Uh, I have a some few points with this. You hit some of my buzz. Oh, 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 fantastic. So I'll just quickly then highlight the sound design is really interesting for anyone that's listening to it, which is uh, the, you know, again, going back to, to your really wonderful phrasing of uh, succeeding the faith of nation. You know, what is this? Uh, <laughs> what does Aryan represent? What is the faith there? But you remember, there is so many uh, siren sounds in this whole scene. It's as if, you know, this kind of, of other immigrant figure, refugee figure that has a power that, re that recalls potentially maybe an Ottoman past, maybe a more cosmopolitan uh, uh, right. Ottoman, Ottoman past to, to uh, resurrect Hungary is to potentially resurrect the Ottoman Empire. I don't know, like that, but what that really is. But remember, the state doesn't want this. The state, it's one of the few, uh, you know, Lajlo looks, looks at our hero, and there are some cases where state actors look at our hero in the film as he's flying. But notably, we often see that the state cannot look upon. It cannot look up. It refuses to look up. And sort of uh, for the most part. But I just want to highlight there is this, this these siren sounds as he floats up. So we have one person falling uh, down on their knees in a kind of religious passion or ecstasy. And kind of recalls, I think, a Christian tradition tied with the complexities of his Muslim this, or at least the Syrian this. Uh, and then we also have, at the same time, as we have this kind of transcendent divinity at work from a Near Eastern source, we also have the sounds of the siren. The siren, uh, which would seem to suggest this figure is a threat to the state. He is, he evokes the sound of emergency. And I think uh, that sense of, I think we have a, have a state to use, succeeding the faith of nation. Here we also have a portrait in the film of a nation defending itself. So yeah, these, those are exactly. some, some of my thoughts. What, are you, what, are you, what is your perspective? All right. <laughs> you got so many of my buzzers. I love it. Um, to get on that whole side of things, it is definitely a sign of uh, alarm because it mm -hmm. is change. 
and change is a threat to any institution. And how I approach any uh, nation state, um, just because uh, as a historian, I try to remain objective and uh, plus yes. one of those guys that loves Nietzsche. So the genealogy of morals is <laughs> I invoke often, but it's uh, I look at it as an organism trying to survive, a social creation that is trying to survive once it has escaped beyond the control yeah. of its creators. Mm. Almost like humans to Adam and Eve in a biblical sense. But, um, oh, that gets me on a whole different tangent thinking about that. But uh, <laughs> to keep with this, the sirens were very important in marking this change. And what also that was audience background that is so similar to other messiah figures in mm. Abrahamic traditions. I mean, you have the other, the subaltern. So, you know, Moses was a slave, a Jewish slave in Egypt. Uh, Muhammad was a, was, I believe it was a merchant of sorts, right? I believe, no, no, it was a merchant of sorts, but I know it was around um, uh, Me uh, Mecca. And mm -hmm. he, his whole journey of having to go out, listen to the word of God, and eventually be one to come back to overtopple their pagan worship of multiple deities and to say, say this is a site where we worship, you know, the one true God. And it kind of represents, and also, of course, there's Jesus, son of a carpenter, came from nowhere, a Jewish group also in Jerusalem that came about to promote fundamental change in people's perceptions. And so you see, um, for me, it's like Aryan is another continuation of this Abrahamic idea of a figure learning that is hated and also loved the paradox of the two of them and kind of showing the next way forward. And it's not an easy path. It's not a compassion filled. Everybody's going to grab hands and sing Kumbaya. Rather, there's going to mm -hmm. be a bunch of questions. There is going to be a bunch of um, existential moments. I mean, even that whole scene of the girl going to her knees, seeing him rise, is another physical example of that existential surrendering to powers and forces and ideas that are out of their control, but you're just awe-spired by them. But this is where I get spicy, mm. because you mentioned the phrase secular, and I read um, this great edited volume called Is Critique, um, Is Critique Secular? And it mm. cha basically challenges the notions of secularism and asks, what does this mean? How was this term created? What is it in conversation with? And the scholar is a mix of Western, um, Middle Eastern, some Near Eastern and European writers commented on secularism. And a lot of them were saying that it is inextricably linked with Christianity. And I'm one of those that agrees with that Kool-Aid. Um, I was very uh, drawn by their arguments, but secular is essentially arguing that it is a religious, correct? It is supposed to be um, mm -hmm. outside of faith and much more mm -hmm. kind of grounded in rationalism and this ability to kind of understand the universe through observations, experiments, and rational thought. But this came about through the scientific revolution which happened with Quakers and Christians alike. Sir Francis Bacon, the great name for a pig, but also um, <laughs> it was uh, the father or the founder, the creator of the scientific method was very much a Christian and wanted us to humans to be able to better understand and control this world that was given to us or that is ours to be shepherds to. Again, it's very much this idea that um, there's a stratification, an ordering of humans, objects, peoples, and other animals. Superhero has no difference. I mean, the fact that it is super directly implicates it in a series of relationships, meaning Superman is not just man, but above in a certain mm -hmm. way, or at least othered. And if something is othered, it's put into relation and therefore in competition, oftentimes. Where I'm, to, I'm getting with this with Arian, it just it it shows how much of well, a for me, uh, how much this is a very uh, Hungarian film and a film from a Abrahamic society, where um, humans are seen as the primary catalysts for change or beacons of change. Mm -hmm. And there's also this the beautiful th um, transition away not transition, but the questioning of the nation state and its validity and the faith behind it. The nation state, again, is supposed to be secular, correct? 
Mm -hmm. But you see everybody treated almost like a church or a communal organism, a, I don't want to say cultural uh, pillar almost, even though it's not really there. It's a decayed, old, and ineffective system for the context. There is still that debate. Do we abandon the old ways, embrace the new? But that also means embracing change, embracing fear. And that's why so many Hungarians are terrified of Arian because mm. he literally exemplifies what they're threatened by. An other coming from some other place and they're forced to confront the injustices of their society. Because if, you, if your Superman is a Syrian refugee, then guess what narrative gets circulated a lot, which is, oh, Syrian refugee, what was that like? Why were your experiences so harsh? And then you have to get exp explained, oh, well, Hungarian society wasn't necessarily the most open or also this whole um, Europe too in this refugee wake. It's a tense. There's a lot of fear, a lot of paranoia. It's not a easy situation to na navigate from the perspective of seeking to preserve a na nation state, which requires a nationality. Mm. It's 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 interesting. Uh, this I love that line, and I'll I'll let you um I'll let mm -hmm. you continue. Uh, but I just want to highlight like require a uh, nation state requires a, a a nationality, a singular nationality. Yes. And I think what's so what's I'm gonna in, not to not to sneak peek where where I'll be bringing you in the movie, but I'm going to ask you about the um I'm gonna work through with you the last moments in the film where. We have, um, we go from everyone looking up, you know, citizens, Hungarian citizens in their cars looking up, uh, a vision of an upside down city for a moment, which I find really interesting and don't fully know. Uh, then we see um, Arian surrounded by state helicopters, and yet we are above Arian, you know, looking down, the god shot, as it were, encompasses both the other and the state. Uh, the, you know, the kind of the, the enemy. And then we have a scene where we have a presumed Syrian refugee, a young boy high, covering his eyes and, uh, and, 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 you know, counting the hide and seek. So the young boy is, is unaware that everyone's looking up. He's in the middle of playing his game. All the people, we don't really see their faces, but we have a sense that everyone around him is caught in this kind of spell that Aryan has over them. However, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the um, the other the disempowered other par excellence the young Syrian boy is is away from any of that wonder in that moment he's playing his own game uh, and his eyes are covered so I'm gonna talk to, I'm gonna talk to you about that in a second but I just want to highlight like it is interesting to me that you sort of say like and the nation state requires a nationality a singular nationality and I think what's so interesting about this film in terms of contemporary Hungary, is that it's a reminder of just, we were talking about the myth of the superhero and the religion of the superhero. What's so interesting to me now, I'm thinking like, is this movie about the myth of nation uh, and and the, the, the religion behind nation, that nation itself requires kind of blind faith? No, uh, it, it replaced the church in a person's mm. state. It is the primary institution in which people construct their lives, whether it's paying taxes, whether it's working, whether it's making sure that the roads are paved, or even the media they um, consume is all inextricably linked to it, just like a church would have been in, let's say, medieval Europe. Or perhaps uh, let's think about the old um, synagogues in the day where they were very much the communal core of Jewish peoples and Jewish societies. People would even pay into it. So if somebody fell on hard times, they would come to the synagogue and they would receive either financial or material help whenever they can. So it's not necessarily as much of a different entity, rather it is fulfilling mm. similar functions, which is again, why it's so scared. It's like a skin sh shedding its outer, um, no, no, a snake shedding its outer, layer of skin peeling off it is perhaps a that's where our beacon can be found is yeah. when we can sort of we can sort of move beyond colonial formations and sort of say wait a second what does it mean to embrace the other and embrace you know embrace non-european cultural traditions to find the power and the transcendence therein so i think for me like thinking about your 
your point on secularism as well, uh, which is I think the film does work to challenge in a kind of fraught way this mm-hmm. notion of you know kind of a Judeo Christian kind of uh, Judeo Christian kind of secularism. Uh, but to, towards the nation state, I'm wondering, you know, going to that specific moment. And so I've highlighted some of the interesting visual elements for you and our listeners, like, you know, about the, the way in which he's flying, the way we see a bunch. And this, this sequence starts um, around 159.25. Uh, and what happened, my copy. And so what happens there is we, we see the shot of the sun and then the camera pans up and then we see a Hungarian city upside down. And so here, I think the film highlights now we're in a topsy-turvy world where, you know, what's up is down and what's down, which is in this case, the Syrian refugee becomes up, right? Uh, uh, becomes becomes the, 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 the sun in many ways for, for Hungary. And then as the sequence holds, we see that he's in fact, another down thing is happening where we sort of see drone imagery. And then we realize that at least the way it seems to be constructed, he's in the God shot evokes for us when we see Aryan and the police helicopters, we see him from the drone perspective in some ways. Um, so then we go back to what was up is now back down, uh, right. you know, and, and then, and then we have that last moment where we have the Syrian boy notably speaking in English so he's using the lingua franca beyond the single nation. He's not speaking Arabic, right? He's speaking a language that Hungarians and other refugees uh, ostensibly will understand in our present globalized moment. So I think even the use of he's counting down in his game of how to seek the boy in English. And so now all of a sudden we're completely cleaved from the quote unquote, our traditional conceptions of what Hungary looks like of con- what contemporary hunger looks like. Instead, the film leaves us with a refugee boy speaking English, ready to play. And I think that's so exciting for me because he's, he's not terrified. He has his eyes covered, but only to, uh, to, to uh, perform a game of imagination with his friends. And so that's why I think the film is so exciting because it ends up not on some religious transcendence, which it does have, but it ends on the possibility that there are new games and new kinds of links of kinship that can be created when we move beyond our traditional ideas of what the nation and specifically Hungary might mean. Does that resonate with you, Milan? Oh yeah, and we're gonna bring it back because it's all about bringing back the Ottoman Empire, baby. Um, <laughs> no, it reminds me so much of plural, multi or multi-ethnic empires and other forms of rule. Um, the reason why the Mongolian Empire spread as much as it did, I mean, not just because of sheer violence and terror and the violence of the state, their state, which might be a little idiosyncratic calling it a state, but their civilization. But they also they only cared about taxes and then sometimes labor, whether that be for um, infrastructural development or fighting. But they let people of other cultures and other faiths live just perfectly fine in this empire. Mm. And as much as um, well, some nationalist historians might push back on this, the Ottoman Empire functioned similarly. Yes, it gave privileges to those that converted to um, Islam, but it still, I mean, Orthodoxy and Catholicism still existed in the system, as well as a bunch of other smaller um, pagan religions and other non-Islamic faiths. So mm-hmm. our independence for me is also a reminder of, hey, there are other ways of life. There are other ways to relate to one another, not just through the national identity, but also through this humanist almost identity. And especially Aryan's role. I mean, that's what we're talking about othering. I mean, He's so far, he's the only one who could fly in the film. So everyone's like, like, okay, we can't fly. That Syrian refugee can. That's another sense of a binary. The one with the superpower mm. than everybody else reminding, hey, we're all much more similar because even though, like, yes, we might look different, speak different, there's this person that it, we can all argue is different from all of us because of these superhuman abilities. And it's a reminder of, kind of is there anything else you would like to say um, to conclude any um what things you've been working on so far any of uh, projects you're excited about well i would just sort of say like i think you know um 
uh, and thank you again for this opportunity to sort of speak with you and your listeners about the project, my projects, about my approach to these kind of forms. But I would just again remind my uh, uh, remind our listeners rather uh, that um, I'm going to be uh, sending out into the world in July uh, my um, monograph. If you're interested in this, this this is a work that I in, I, in my memory I do. I don't touch on Jupiter's moon. Uh, I think there might be a global se- sequel to this project, uh, mm-hmm. but I do talk about uh, Sierra Nevada in my upcoming book and a few. Just a few, but a few key uh, films that are invested in uh, genre, Hollywood genre forms like the Western film noir and the superhero. And so that that book is coming out from SUNY Press, and it's called No Jurisdiction, Legal, Political, and Aesthetic Disorder in Post-9-11 Genre Cinema. And I would invite your listeners to um, uh, check out the book. You just put in my name, Fareed Ben Youssef, and the title. And I'm sure, I know, I'll give you a link, uh, Milan, so you can... Yeah, yeah, when you when you, when you, when you, there, right, you know, the, uh, to help out, but I'd also sort of say, if your listeners are interested in um, either uh, talks around the book or moderated screenings where we can have these kinds of conversations about the particular, spend our time, an hour or two of time, talking about four to five minutes of the film, uh, <laughs> but, really, but really getting into it, uh, you know, um, uh, I would be uh, deeply happy to participate in any such forums and just to uh, uh, offer spaces by which we can think about the way genres like the superhero frame the shifting meanings of our wars, whether it be our war on terror or our humanitarian crises, in this case, the refugee crisis. So, yeah, my book is coming out. I would remind everyone to uh, look out for that coming out in July and to be in touch with me at uh, Fareed Ben Youssef, which my our email is F B E N Y O U. S at ttu.edu. I'll give you all that information, Milan, so you can share. Uh, for those who are interested in, in talking to me directly I, about this film or about any other, I, I would love to keep the conversation going with you and your listeners. And that ends my fantastic conversation with Dr. Farid Ben Yusuf. I hope you enjoyed our conversation and keep an eye out for his upcoming monograph. See you next time. <laughs>